You probably know Woody Allen's joke, every time I listen to Wagner I feel the urge to conquer Poland. Well, if you felt that urge recently, you can finally satisfy behind played Summer Lightning, which is the most recent uh, game published by Lock and Load Games. And the topic is the German invasion of Poland in 1939, a topic that has not been covered by a huge number of games, probably and mainly because of how difficult it is to render such an unequal conflict and still make it into an interesting game. Um, this is a game that has a couple of interesting mechanics, in particularly a nearly dialless combat system, which was pioneered by the same uh, designer in a previous game of his, Autumn Mist, but since I don't know that the game really became a classic, I don't know how many people know it, so I guess that this system will still feel new to many players. Also, it is a game with a very short, very simple rule book. You may have the impression this is a very light game, but once you start playing it, you see that it is heavier and deeper than you thought at first, um, it still takes some commitment and well, trust me, it is not going to be Memoir 39. This is the initial setup and of course the map of the game. Here you see the majority of the German forces that are just ready to invade, there are the German forces there and there, and the Polish forces are scattered around and well, they're gonna start running and try to uh, get together and solidify the lines pretty soon. I set up the game on my regular desk, as you can see from around here, rather than my game table, because I wanted to watch a movie on my computer screen in the meanwhile, just because if you set up the game by yourself, it can be a little bit of a chore. It took me around an hour. There are just so many little pieces that need to go in the right axe. That's the way it is. A turn is divided in a number of impulses and during each impulse an activation chip is drawn from the common pool. These two pools in fact will be mixed together in a mug and each of these activation chits corresponds to a specific headquarter that will activate when that chit is drawn. Then the player that owns that headquarter will activate the headquarter, the headquarter will activate several units and once the actions of the activated units are resolved then you pull another chit and you have another impulse. Once a course headquarter is activated, that headquarter can activate units up to three movement factors from the X where the headquarter is, and the number of units that can be activated is up to six divisional units. This is the symbol for the division, so here we have two stacks of three divisions each, perfectly legal, and then any number of subdivisional units, and this is the, this is the symbol for the subdivisional units. So all of these units could be activated by this headquarter when the activation chip for this headquarter is drawn. Army headquarters work a little differently because they can activate any number of units that cannot be brought under command by any other headquarter. So that is good, you don't have to worry about units being completely left out of command and just being left behind for the rest of the game. However, units activated in this fashion by the army headquarters can be activated by move for movement but not for attack, so it's not as good. Also, the army headquarter can move itself and can activate another headquarter up to six movement factors connected by road from the position of the army headquarter and that headquarter can in turn activate units normally. In this case if you activate this head army headquarter it can activate units wherever on the map as long as no other headquarters could activate them and then it can activate this guy that in turn will activate these other people. You have different types of movements available, you can execute tactical movement, which is regular movement, or strategic movement, which is faster but can be executed only on roads, you have exploitation movement, which happens after combat, but let's face it, what you really want to know is not about movement, but you want to know how combat works. Well, let's take a look at that. Combat is resolved using this mission matrix here, and six chits representing defensive missions here, and four chits representing attack missions. The players will choose a cheat each secretly, of course, the defender will choose one of these, and the attacker will choose one of these, and then they will reveal their choice to each other, and they will cross-reference their selections to see what the impact of their choices is on that combat. For example, frontal attack versus counter-attack, or you can have balance versus standfast. 
each result on the mission matrix table presents four pieces of information. Two pieces, the ones on the left apply to the attacker and two pieces of information apply to the defender. Let's look at the ones at the bottom first because they're sort of like more um, intuitive. Um, these two pieces of information tell you if the attacker is going to be able to advance after combat and by how many axes, in this case attacker advances by one X and if there's going to be a retreat and by how many axes the defender must retreat, in this case the defender retreats by one X. The part on top refers to casualty checks. If there is a number there, including a zero, it means that that side must take one or more casualty checks. <clears throat> The number itself uh, indicates also the modifier. In this case, for example, the attacker will take casualty checks with modifier of zero, the defender with casualty checks with modifier of plus one, here will be plus three and plus two. But <clears throat> the fact that there is a number just indicates that there are going to be casualty checks only. If you have this symbol here, there are not going to be casualty checks for that side. The number of casualty checks that a side must take corresponds to the number of fresh full strength divisions that are participating into the combat on the enemy's side. The subdivisional units do not contribute to the number of checks that a side must take. For example, in this case, the Polish player has three divisions which are full strength and here the German player has five units but only three divisions. That means that if both must take casualty casualty checks, they both will have to roll three times for casualties, the German because of the three Polish divisions and the Polish because of the three full strength German divisions. Each casualty check is assigned a casualty check number, which corresponds to the total number of combat factors involved in that combat from the opposite side. In this case, for example, the German player will have a combat factor of 11, so subdivisional units do add their brute strength to the, the casualty checks, just not to the number of casualty checks. So in this case, the basic number that the Polish player has to roll against is 11, but the number is modified by a number of other factors. For example, the modifiers that you saw on the mission matrix table, there are modifiers for being out of supply, for special certain units just get a default modifier, also there are modifiers based on the terrain where the defender is. Once you have the modified final casualty check number, then the player rolls a die, and if the player rolls more than the casualty check number, then nothing happens, the casualty check has been passed, otherwise for each casualty check where the player rolls the same or less, then the player loses a step. This system is pretty original, it has important effects on the game and at first may feel a little mechanic, but actually it is subtle then it's subtler than it may look like at first. I'll give an example. Suppose that the German player has mounted a powerful attack such as this one with 20 combat factors and five casualty checks to be inflicted on the opponent. Well, if this is the situation, even with all the modifiers, probably in the end the um, casualty check number that the German player will produce and the Polish player has to roll against will be more than 10. That means an automatic casualty for each casualty check that is going to be uh, inflicted. And that means that this group of Polish units will lose five steps, meaning two of these will be destroyed and only one will survive like that with only one step left. However, uh, in this case, the German player also has to take three casualty checks because these are three divisions and the total number for the Polish player is still nine. So if there aren't other modifiers, it is still very likely that the German player will have to take several uh, step losses and suppose that he decides to distribute them evenly. Well, look at this. And then, well, this is the end of the combat. Well, suppose that these guys have been almost destroyed and this guy survived. Okay, then this group of units moves on the map and faces other Polish units, such as this one. Another group of units, such as this one. Well, look at this. The combat factor of the German group is still very strong. Four and four is uh, eight, ten. Uh, 12, 14, so if there aren't any other modifiers, still it's going to be one casualty automatically for each casualty check, but 
Look at this. Now, actually, the German player can only inflict two casualty checks, cannot inflict more than two step losses in each attack, because these guys here are contributing their combat factors, yes, but not contributing to the number of casualty checks to be inflicted anymore. The German player will have to start moving units around to try to combine spent divisions that can contribute factors, but not casualty checks, with fresh divisions, so that the spent division, the reduced divisions can contribute their combat and maybe take some some hits, whereas there is gonna there are gonna be fresh divisions in each stack that are actually able to contribute um, to inflict casualty checks. A turn continues until all headquarters have been activated or until the players decide that they have activated all the headquarters that they want to activate for that turn. And you continue like that, turn after turn, <clears throat> until the German player takes control of Warsaw. At that point, several events are triggered. The first one is that the game may end. Each turn there will be a role to determine whether the game continues or not, and that role is modified by the number of Polish cities that are still under <clears throat> the control of the Polish player. So the more cities the German player controls, the more likely the game is to end, which can be an advantage for the German player. Also, starting from the fall of Warsaw, the uh, Polish player is allowed to retreat units off map and those units are out of the game but also do not give victory points to the German player. Also, another important event, in turn 8, the Soviet Union joins the fight. Uh, the Soviet units are controlled by the German player, but when that happens, it means that the surviving Polish units will have to defend against two fronts and things are going to be yeah, pretty dire at that point. Once the game is over, victory is determined, counting with three points that are assigned mainly for elimination of enemy units and enemy headquarters. The key word for this game is story-centric. This game really tells you a story, constructs a strong narrative, and in fact the different phases of the game play very different from one another. At the beginning, especially during the first turn, you have special modifiers and rules that make sure that the Polish player takes as much as much pain as possible, he suffers as much as a man can suffer. In fact, at the beginning the Polish player cannot do much, there's going to be this huge impact on the German attack, then the Polish player says, whoa, uh, getting things together and starting to mount a defense, but that in a certain way only delays the unavoidable because sooner or later Warsaw is going to fall and at that point the a Polish player had to start running, and the German player also has to switch strategy a little from concentrating forces in the in the fast penetration. Then he has to start spreading forces around to conquer as many cities as possible. It really is a story, and I believe that this game, in fact, um, is enjoyable, especially in that perspective. If you enjoy seeing this series of events developing in front of you, as a game per se, it is not. <clears throat> a game that both players have the same chances of winning. The rulebook makes no mysteries about this. They already tell you that the game will end in a major uh, German victory or a minor German victory. If the Polish player is a military genius and very lucky, he may end up you know, getting a draw. Uh, Actually, there are ways in which you can balance the game and customize the game and add a lot of optional rules to make things more equal, but I would say, why would you want to play a game like this with this topic, which is so interesting per se, and then completely distort it in such a way that you can play a game that is as balanced as chess? Play chess! Um, I, I just think that many people that will be drawn by this game, they want to see this type of story this type of narrative that the game has to offer uh, coming from this game. This being said, that means also that the Polish player has to play in a certain frame of mind, has to really be willing to participate to the story, because otherwise his experience can be a little frustrating. The Polish player plays less often than the German player. At the beginning he really cannot do much. When he gets to play, he has less units and very often is forced just to do a little bit of defense, trying to cut a supply line, but it does not have that huge range of things that he can do. 
it can be painful but if you're the polish player and you see things in the right perspective if you measure your achievements based on your limitations and your desperate situation actually can be pretty interesting i believe that the game requires um, players that are committed to work gaming and are committed to this story um, if they enter this perspective then i believe that this game can uh, be extremely interesting and entertaining for them